I'm Amanda, and this is Not Your Granny's Quilt Show. On today's show, we have a really fun guest. Her name is Amory Thompson. She's got an Instagram called Next Gen Quilting. So if you haven't found her yet, get in there, check her out, and enjoy the conversation. Thank you so much for joining me today. I've got Amory Thompson of Next Gen Quilting with me. How are you? Hi, Amanda. Good. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, thanks. Um, first, before we get into anything, um, for those of my listeners who maybe haven't found you yet, um, why don't you go ahead and fill us in a little bit on um, who you are and what you do? Sure. So my name is Amory Thompson. Um, I'm a modern millennial quilter based here in San Francisco, California. Um, I'm on Instagram under the name Next Gen Quilting. And I specialize in making quilts that are sustainable to both the planet uh, and also your wallet. So I focus on ways to use upcycled and zero waste sewing solutions as um, well as budget-friendly hacks to save money while also creating beautiful modern quilts along the way. Awesome. Well, that is what attracted me to your Instagram. I was like, wow, this is such cool stuff. And I started looking more into you and seeing you know, all about that. So I'm just excited to chat with you today. So how did you get into quilting? Like, is it, has it been a long time or are you new to it? Yeah. So, uh, relatively new. So I have actually only been quilting for two years. Um, I started in August of 2020 in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. So it all started quite honestly with a late night internet search for a crafty quarantine hobby to pass the time. I mean, ultimately I wanted to emerge from all of the time sheltering in place mm -hmm. with some kind of new skill, but also needed and wanted to become part of a virtual community along the way to give me a way to really connect with folks in the outside world. You know, during the pandemic, everyone's social circle became incredibly small. Mm -hmm. And you basically only interacted with people in your immediate household, maybe the occasional Zoom call with your coworkers or your family before we all got more accustomed to that lifestyle. So not only did I, I start a new craft journey with quilting at this time, but then I also started my Instagram account, Next Gen Quilting, to learn from and really connect with the quilting community online and just be a part, just be a part of that um, and expand my horizon. So when I got started, I actually didn't know anything about quilting specifically. Um, my mom bought me my first sewing machine when I was 15 so that I could sew a few pillowcases for my bedroom. And she showed me the basics, you know, how to sew a straight line essentially. But for the most part, I'm pretty self-taught and it's always just been me and my sewing machine and the sewing machine manual <laughs> and good old trial and error. Um, and so honestly, I really, I really do credit YouTube and the Instagram quilting community for everything that I know about quilting today. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I mean, I haven't been quilting that much longer than you, but it's crazy. Like how much is out there and how quickly you can actually learn a lot of skills around sewing and quilting just through, like you said, the Instagram community and YouTube and it's, everything's out there. And I, I kind of love that because I think so for so long, it was almost like people kept it like proprietary. They were like, oh, you have to join this guild and you have to do these things or take these special classes to learn this skill because mm -hmm. nobody else is going to teach you for free. Mm -hmm. I love that it's just people are putting it out there and showing like, well, this is how I do it. Because I think too, there can be a tendency to think like there's one way to quilt, but there are so many ways to quilt and so many ideas out there that are valid and good. And I think it's awesome that, you know, people are sharing everything now. Yeah. So. It's so useful. I mean, I'm such a, I'm such a visual learner. And so it's so useful to have YouTube and Instagram that are really visual platforms out there. It, honestly, even the most low budget, low quality video can sometimes be like the most helpful when somebody just zooms in on something super random on their sewing machine to just show, you know, how to read the quarter inch on your presser foot, you know, and, and where that is, or just like really basic stuff. Um, I'm just incredibly grateful that anyone out there has taken the time to record that and share that information. It's just been really, really helpful for me because I have never taken a class. I have never, um, I've never even been to a, a physical 
quilting store. Um, I've bought everything online. I've, <laughs> I've been like totally virtual with this entire, with this entire journey. So um, wow. it just goes to show that the amount of the plethora of information online is, is something that can really take you somewhere. Yeah. That's amazing. I can't believe that you've never set foot in a quilting store. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? <laughs> um, kind of. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's good for you, like the whole sustainability piece, because you go in there <laughs> with intentions and then you come out with way more than what you intended. I mean, at least I do. So yeah. I think that's probably good because, you know, once you touch it and you see it in person, you're like, okay, I need some of that too. Okay. I need some of that too. <laughs> I'm yeah. But I did promise myself, I'm not going to buy any more fabric until the like at least through the end of the year, because I have so much and I have so many projects built up. And I'm like, I need to use this fabric that I have because it's just getting ridiculous. I love that. I love that goal. You know, you can do so many things without having to go into a quilt shop or like, I think just this advent of like online, everything has kind of made things more accessible. And, you know, especially you starting quilting during the pandemic, like what were you going to do? You couldn't yeah. take a class. You couldn't go to the quilt shop. Like, so you had to exactly. source it online. And, and, you know, if that's a way that you've built up how you do things, like there's no sense in changing it if it works. And so I think, you know, it's dangerous <laughs> shopping in person, <laughs> but so I totally get that, but I do, I like, I think I've been a person who's always kind of leaned on like buying new stuff and like like oh if I just have this thing it'll make me happy or if I just like have this certain outfit I'll be happy and which is you know I'm working on it and <laughs> so it's fine but <laughs> I think it's like goes with fabric too like all these new lines of fabric come out every day it's like every day some new kind of fabric comes out and unfortunately I love so many designers that are out there and so I'm like, oh, I need to buy that fabric. Oh, I need to buy that fabric. And so it can get really overwhelming to try to keep up with that. And yeah. I think just this year, especially I've like kind of taken a seat back and gone, this is not sustainable for me. I have nowhere to keep this. So much of my stuff is at my mom's house because I have nowhere to keep it here at my house. And so like just the idea that I need to be able to store things in my home and not keep buying stuff that I'm not even using and hoarding fabric that I'm like, I didn't have a plan. I just bought it. <laughs> it's like really yeah. been weighing on me. So yeah. when I, you know, I've been like following you and look, looking at your stuff and like seeing what you're doing, I'm like, I could get behind that. I can do this. Like I can, I can scrap quilt. I can, you know, I always see scrappy quilts and think they're so cute, but I just have never taken the time to do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to look at sort of like the history of quilting and, and where things have come, because on one hand, it's really, it's really neat. It's really neat, like the modern quilting um, industry, what the modern quilting industry has become and all of the really unique um, fabric designers and artists out there that have the opportunity to share their designs um, on all of these beautiful and gorgeous fabrics. But then it's also, you know, on the flip side, so incredibly different from where this hobby all started, which was to take you know, scrappy things that you already owned and turn them into something functional mm -hmm. that you needed. Um, and so we've kind of gone from like, you know, zero to 360 um, mm -hmm. on the on the spectrum here. And now I think we're kind of at this point where, to your point, um, a lot of quilters are taking a look at, at kind of where they've landed and having this kind of reckoning moment and saying, okay, you know, maybe maybe more isn't always better. Maybe I need to dial back and sort of find some happy medium between those two approaches. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because I think um, there can be, there's beauty in both, right? There's beauty in both getting new things, but also using what you already have. And I think, you know, marrying the two and just doing what's like more sustainable for your life is, you know, what's in the important piece of it. And looking at like the impact that what you're doing is having, like, like I'm taking up a ton of room in my mom's house. Well, that's not very fair. Like I have my own house. Like that mm -hmm. alone is kind of like, doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but at the end of the day, it is because I'm taking up more space, you know, I'm, I'm leaving a larger footprint, I guess is, is the idea there. So 
don't know. It's, it's a shift in thinking for me. So I think I have a lot more work to do, but I really admire people who can make it happen and who are just like, yeah, I just sew from my scraps and I, you know, source things sustainably. And so it's, it's super cool. But do you have like a favorite way to find fabrics or do you have like resources that are tried and true or do you just kind of piecemeal? You know, I, so when I first got started, um, I, I purchased a few, a few fabrics, um, but because it was during the pandemic where shipping became this huge question mark, you know, demand for fabric went through the roof and, and suppliers were unable to know when and if they could ship anything out. And so it was like this huge question mark. And then when something was shipped, you know, you didn't even know when you were going to get it, if the postal workers were working to deliver it to your doorstep. So um, I actually, when I, I first started, I had, you know, a little bit of yardage of, of fabric that I had purchased. Um, but I then started sourcing from things just around my house. You know, I, I looked into my own closet, found some button down shirts that were cotton, some sheets in my linen closet that weren't being utilized, some, you know, flannel sheets that could be used as, as batting and just started to get really scrappy in that way. Um, for one, because I didn't have the fabric, but also because I was just learning quilting in general. And I thought, you know, why use all of this beautiful, expensive fabric on, on a, on a new project, a new endeavor, um, before I get good at it and why not just use, you know, like what I've already had. Um, but then I really just like fell in love with that approach in reusing and like breathing new life into into existing textiles that I really kind of found a, a struck a nice balance between the two of like you can use new but also use old and kind of combine the two to to make use of of what you already what you already own so I source from from my closet whether that's my my clothes closet or my linen closet um I have reached out to fellow instagrammers the the, the instagram quilting community for scraps in the past, I've had people ship me boxes of scraps that they're not using anymore, that they um, that they don't want to throw away, but they don't think that they'll ever use. Mm -hmm. I even went last year to a, there was a big rummage sale in my, in my area where there was like this huge scrap bin and it was like for $3, you could fill up a, a bag, you know, as heavy as you could with, with scraps. And so that was like a treasure trove. I think I spent like my entire time at this rummage sale at the scrap <laughs> bin. <laughs> So it, it all just, um, depends. I've had, you know, I've done some partnerships with fabric companies. And so I have some, I have some fabric lines that are relatively new that are part of the mix to, um, so between, between work and, um, sort of secondhand sourcing, whether that's at my house or, um, at a sale kind of all over the place, um, yeah. but there's, there's always fabric somewhere in your house. <laughs> Yeah, I had a quilt where I, I was running low on, I needed like a mustard yellow fabric and I was running low from what was in my stash. And so I found a, I had a cotton dish towel in my kitchen and I was like, this will, this will work. And yeah. so I cut that, cut that apart. And I was like, I, you know, how many, you only need so many dish towels, right? So I can do with one less and, and cut that apart and threw it in my quilt. And I think sometimes like a lot of creativity stems from scarcity. So if you keep, like, I like to keep my scrap stash really small because then I start to think outside the box of like, if something, if I don't have enough of something, I probably would have never looked into using a kitchen towel if I would have just had this like overabundance of fabric as a part of my stash. Right, exactly. I think that's admirable because I think you're right. When you, when you don't have a lot just like sitting around or you don't think, oh, I'll just run to the store and grab more then you have to start thinking outside the box and looking yeah. for different ways to, to accomplish things. So was it like, I guess, obviously like during the pandemic, you just had to kind of use what you had around, but is it something like a lifestyle that you already practice or were you like, you yeah, know, low that's waste? a good question. The sort of the low zero waste kind of making mentality. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I approach, I, I utilize that mentality for my quilting for a couple of reasons. I think when it, one, when it comes to material goods, I, I really am a minimalist, you know, throughout my entire adult life, I've always lived in big urban cities mm -hmm. where space and storage have been incredibly limited. And you've had to be, you've had to be really resourceful about how do you use your closet space, you know, vertically, 
horizontally all right. the things to fit, you know, all of your stuff. And, and the second it doesn't fit, you know, you, you got to start getting rid of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't like owning a lot of stuff and clutter honestly makes me crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually, every time we move, I like hesitate to move to a larger space because I know I'm just going to have more stuff <laughs> that comes along with it. Yeah. Um, so, th so that's one of the reasons I also would say I'm a pretty like resourceful person. I hate being wasteful and throwing things away when I know that I can find some kind of alternative use for them, whether that's, um, that's me utilizing it in an alternative way or finding a donation center where they'll take it and, and give it a second life. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so that's one. And then, you know, lastly, I'm honestly just, the more I looked into the, the world of textiles, when I got into quilting and, and fabric, the more I was just really blown away by some of the statistics about textile waste that mm -hmm. are out there. So I'm obviously by no means a, a sustainability expert, but but from what I've read and according to the you know, Environmental Protection Agency in the United States alone, there are 11.3 million tons of textile waste that ends up in our, our landfills every year. And to put that into perspective, the average American generates like 70 pounds of waste of textiles annually, every single year. So that includes things like clothing that we're throwing away mm -hmm. um, with fast fashion, linens, towels, fabric. Um, all that kind of stuff that we, that we throw out. And, and when we throw it in the garbage bin, it doesn't just go away. You know, it, it takes years and years for these products to decompose and, mm -hmm. and they're generating greenhouse gas emissions along the way, which ultimately aren't great for our planet long-term. So right. when I think about all of those things combined, I'm obviously, you know, as tempting as it is to, to always buy the latest and greatest fabric collection. And trust me, I know I've I've given into it, you know, I've purchased, I, I purchased fabric, you know, I'm not, I'm not immune to that in any way, shape or form, but, but I, but I do always like to encourage quilters to do things like one, use what you have before you mm -hmm. buy more, which I love that you, that you already mentioned that one, because I think that's the easiest is, you know, just like put your horse finders on, yeah. <laughs> use what you have right. um, before, before you buy more. Um, upcycle things that you already own. So like household textiles, whenever you can. So we all have a linen closets filled with old sheets that we're not using or throw blankets that could be used for batting or for some kind of cozy, fuzzy um, backing for a quilt. Mm -hmm. Flannel sheets and fleece blankets work really great for, for batting. So there's, you know, a variety of different ways to use um, household textiles or, or even the own, you know, your own clothes in your closet. I would say like but cotton button down shirts work really great. Cotton chino pants work really great. You don't, it doesn't have to be a t-shirt quilt. I know that, um, you know, stretchy t-shirt fabric is tricky to, to use, but anything that's, um, you know, a, a cotton, a more sturdy cotton fabric works really great for, um, for quilts. And then obviously rethinking anything before you throw it away, you know, can these scraps become a scrappy quilt? Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't have a piece of fabric large enough for the pattern requirement, but you could stitch together three smaller pieces that you do have to create that four inch block or six inch block or whatever square you need for the pattern requirement. And at the end of the day, when that all gets quilted out, you're not going to see it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you're not going to see it instead of, instead of ordering more fabric because you don't think you have enough, start to get creative um, and sew things together, whether that's fabric or even batting. I'm like a huge advocate for Frank and batting. Mm -hmm. Take your batting strips, sew them all together. They are going to be inside your quilt. Nobody will ever see them. They're going to be sewn shut. And yeah. so, um, you know, pulling together different different batting scraps to make Franken batting. So I think just rethinking, you know, little rethinking things a little bit before you throw something away, or even just before you throw it into a bin that you're never going to, you know, revisit again. And how can you utilize those in in your current or next project? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that is, we do Franken batting a lot because it is, it's a, it's not cheap and it's just fine. Just like you said, yeah. it's inside, it's sandwiched between the outside things that you see. And if you're going to quilt it well, then it's, you're never going to know. Like, <laughs> yeah. and I just think of like all the like fast products, like home decor, like the, 
like bed quilts you can buy or, you know, even comforters, like they just put a bunch of polyfill in there and tack down random spots along the way and hope for the best. And like, they get all wonky and weird. And so you're like, well, at least my quilt's going to be better than that. <laughs> yeah. Even yeah. if the batting did come apart, it wouldn't matter. Cause I think yeah. it's, yeah. it's just in there. Yeah. But, and I do think there's a mentality of, um, perfectionism too in this industry and and you know participating in in quilt shows or entering entering projects and you know for competitions that's a completely different animal that I have never touched and probably will never touch so I can appreciate there is a need for some of that in some way shape or form in certain capacities but for the average general quilter you know I think whether you're making quilts for yourself or you're gifting them for people there's so many little things you can do to just um, be a little bit be a little bit more sustainable, get a little bit craftier with how to, how to repurpose and some of the, some of the textiles you're using. Yeah. And I think too, like there's so many, I think people think like, oh, I need to get all new fabric because I'm not going to have the right size of scraps. And I know I've been falling, I like I've fallen prey to that way of thinking just like, oh, I'm not going to have enough or like there's that strip isn't going to be big enough or whatever the silly thought is. But then when I look at like all these quilts that get created by scrap quilters, people who, you know, live off of their scraps, like they make these gorgeous quilts. And I'm like, why do I hesitate? Like, I think, and I think it's the perfectionism. Like if it's not the right size, like it's going to have a seam and it's going to look weird. And, but like you said, once it's all quilted together and, and done, you're never going to notice it. And it adds character, I think to the finished product because your quilt gets to be even that much more unique than someone else's yeah and yeah and even if there's a fabric that you do like you do need and you do want to be consistent with how you've started you'd be surprised if you reach out on social media and see if anyone see if anyone has it somebody might have already bought it before you like reach out to the you know a fabric supplier who's going to have to create more of it mm -hmm. um it might have already been purchased out in the world from somebody that um would be willing to to, to send it to you, you know, Venmo them a few bucks for shipping or something. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is, that's one of the things I do love about the quilting community. It's like how generous people are and giving, like, I know I'm happy to send scraps and share what I have, you know, because again, like, what am I going to do with it? Unless yeah. I just only start sewing scrap quilts like I'm never going to bust through all the scraps I have piled up like I have some set aside specifically because um I have intentions <laughs> to make uh like a bookcase quilt and use some of the scraps of different quilts I've made and use the selvages as the like mm. book spines mm -hmm. um because I save all most of my selvages too because most of them are so cute <laughs> And like making string blocks is another way like that I've kind of worked towards using scraps, which I don't know yeah. if that's something you've ever done, but it's super fun. And yeah. It's on my list. I've seen, I've, I've bookmarked a few and I've seen, um, several people do, do string quilts on, um, on Instagram. So it's certainly on my, my to-do list, but you're right about this community being super generous. When I, first got started quilting I wanted to make a scrappy quilt but I didn't have any scraps I <laughs> I didn't have any fabric I had just started you know I had like two fabrics and you know scraps of two fabrics doesn't really get you to to a cool scrappy unique quilt so I um you know I reached out to the Instagram community and I asked all of my virtual friends for scraps and I was totally blown away by the generosity that poured in and it was like Christmas every time a new box of scraps hit my doorstep um, and I got to see what what various quilters had sent me and um, and it was really neat because I eventually turned all the scraps into this beautiful you know nine patch twin size quilt that has this beautiful rainbow gradient to it and mm -hmm. I, I love that I love that quilt because it gives it it's an it signifies not only the the community of this you know the the quilting community and how generous this community is and yeah. um and all the great uh great work that people are really just really giving and the, the power of this community but it also embraces the spirit of upcycling you know what's one quilter's trash is sort of another quilter's treasure um yeah. and so you know to this day i get people who dm me on instagram all the time and say 
I've got a bunch of, you know, batting scraps. Do you need them right now? Or I've got scraps of this. Do you want them right now? So, um, you know, honestly, if you, if you reach out to the community, you probably never have to buy fabric again, if you really didn't want to. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're like, I mean, honestly, it's true. Like people out there want to share and they want to give of what they have. And I think you just have to be brave enough to ask. And it's, I know, like I literally today just sent fabric to England because someone asked for scrap because they want to make a scrappy duffel bag and they want fabrics from people that they know from all around the world and you know, amazing. Wherever at. and so I was like, Oh, here you go. I've got some of that. I just happened to have, you know, some old Ruby star that was, you know, their cotton and steel days. And that's what she was kind of looking for. And so I sent her the scraps from a quilt I had already made and I didn't need it anymore. And that's so amazing. It's like, yeah. I don't know. I think it's, I think it's a byproduct of our, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, like rugged individualistic culture in America that we just think we have to do everything alone, but we really don't like yeah. people really are so generous. And I think, especially in the quilting community, like we know that we're making things for other people and that we're not just only quilting for ourselves and, and there has to be a heart of generosity in there somewhere, right? Like, yeah. even if you are quilting just for yourself, it, you have to be generous with your time and you have to be generous with yourself. Like as far as like relaxing on the, the perfectionism and powering through to get something done. So I think it just, yeah, it pays, it pays itself forward. And, and when the more you lean into it and for sure, I love that you collaborated with somebody internationally because I also know that a lot of international markets fabric is incredibly expensive. It, it mm -hmm. feels expensive here in the United States, um, but it's even it's even more expensive. I know in other countries and um, less accessible because of that. And so even yeah. um, you know if you're if you're a quilter that has scraps that is looking to give them a new home, I would encourage anybody to put a call out on on social media and and offer that up to somebody. You'd be surprised at who may chime in and say, "Yeah, I'll pay for shipping," you know, <laughs> to have mm -hmm. that have that sent my way and just sort of create this, um, this circular economy among quilters, um, you know, domestically and interna internationally. Yeah. It's, I think it's, you know, again, something you just have to reach out and say, Hey, would anybody be willing? And, and so many people are, <laughs> which is great. And I just love that about being part of the community is, you know, being reminded of that on the daily and like I'm so willing to be giving like why wouldn't someone else like I know mm -hmm. I'm not the only one so I think that's such a cool way to to like get involved with other people but also to make something so cool because then you do you have those memories and and you can write down you know who sent you what so that when you have like a a record of where everything came from and I think too because quilting is you're creating like a an heirloom almost right like when you die that hopefully that quilt will be around some for some time and I know there's been times when great grandparents of mine or you know family members have passed away and they're like oh this was theirs and I'm like well where'd it come from like how do they get it or what and they're like I don't know I'm like well <laughs> so I like the concept of like keeping like a record sheet of where quilts came from or who made them or why, you know, where the fabric came from, especially if they're coming from, you know, scrap fabric or yeah, donations and yeah, just enriches the story that much more. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, do you have a favorite quilt that you've made? Like one that you just over yeah. and you're like, yep, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that um, the the one I just mentioned, this this scrappy summer quilt that had that was a nine patch sort of rainbow quilt from scraps from um, Instagram quilters, um, is one of my favorites. Just for the reasons that that I had mentioned, it's signifying kind of the power of this community, and then also embracing the spirit of upcycling. But then also, I think it's a pretty close tie to um, I made a chambray shirt quilt so when I first started quilting 
I didn't have a good appreciation for the cost of fabric either, not only the availability, but the cost of fabric. And as my personal spending on this new hobby was ticking up <laughs> and fabric was becoming harder to get during the pandemic too, um, because of shipping, shipping times and demands kind of all being up in the air. I was obviously searching for sustainable budget-friendly solutions. And I turned to my closet and um, my, my clothes and linens that I already owned. And I turned six different chambray shirts and two bed sheets and a couple of fleece blankets all into a quilt. So the, the quilt top is chambray shirt, um, half square triangles mixed with a, a pattern that was part of a sheet. And then the batting was a couple different fleece blankets uh, sewn together inside. And the backing was um, a different sheet with a different pattern. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's one of my favorites. It was so such a cool challenge to figure out like all of the different chambray shirts were different shades of blue. And so I was trying to figure Ooh. out, you know, how, how will this all work together? I only have so much fabric from, from this particular shirt and only so much fabric from this particular shirt. So like the planning process was really um, interesting to me. Yeah. And, and then I just, I just loved every second of making it. And then, you know, by the end of it, having this huge, you know, twin size quilt from stuff that uh, was just from around my house, was just a really cool felt like a really cool accomplishment that's so cool I love that and um you have pictures on your Instagram right so I do yes yeah there's pictures of that one on my Instagram for sure um I actually just did um like a reel the other day where I posted all 13 quilts that I had made to date so it's in there um that's probably like the most recent place that you can that you can find it oh that's so cool yeah I love that Plus a handful of other like small miscellaneous quilting projects, like aprons sure. and table runners and stuff, but I don't count those. Sure. <laughs> those aren't as like big as a quilt. So they kind of are just like, oh. yeah, there's such quick, quick little, quick little projects that, that I don't count those, but, um, yeah. but I, and I think, um, I know one of your questions to me was do, do I still have them all or do yeah. I gift them away to people? Um, I, had them all um up until earlier this year and then I gave half of them away to a nonprofit effort called Wrap Ukraine with Quilts okay so it's a nonprofit that's run by this gal Gina Hallid Halliday and she's on Instagram at hello cottons and she is committed to collecting and shipping quilts to Ukrainian refugees over in Poland and it's such a really, it's such a cool program. She started collecting quilts back in March and her goal was to send like a few hundred quilts to Ukraine. And I think right now they're over like 8,000 quilts donated and, wow. and still ticking up counting and they're collecting quilts until the end of 2022. I know she's got visions for expanding her, her program in a bunch of different directions. So we'll see kind of where it's, um, where it's headed, but any, Anyway, Gina and her team have been doing really amazing work. Um, and so whenever I, I get a chance to sing their praises, um, I do. But I gave, so I gave six of my quilts to the Wrap with Wrap Ukraine with Quilts initiative um, earlier this year. So I still have, was that like me with seven mm -hmm. in my closet? Obviously I want to hang on to my favorites, but I'd like to part with more soon because <laughs> yeah. I simply don't have the space to store them all, um, you know, living in the city in San Francisco means space yeah. is really limited. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's becoming even more limited because my husband and I are expecting a baby in November. So we're trying to find more storage space, uh, mm -hmm. among our limited storage space to begin with. That is also very coveted. So that means more quilts probably need to find a new home. <laughs> right. Well, they need room for your baby quilts. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> So anyway, yeah. So I don't, I don't sell or gift any of my quilts because they're really all just like passion projects that I, I make for fun. And I never know where my creative juices will take me, um, when I start a new one. And I just love, I love the idea of just giving it away to somebody that can give it a, a new home, sort of in the spirit of, of where, where the project from a sustainability lens all started. So, yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. I haven't really, I mean, I've made quilts for people, you know, as gifts and of course, every friend who has a baby gets a new quilt and, you know, wedding gifts and all that and just them for just for fun. But I definitely have a lot of quilts, <laughs> yeah. yeah. but I use them so I don't feel 
terrible because they rotate, you know, bedroom, couch, display wall behind me. Um, sure. And we rent out one of our rooms as an Airbnb in our house. And so okay. we named it the cozy quilt house. And so of course we have to have quilts around, for, yeah. you know, oh, that's great. room and, but yeah, there's definitely, I think there can be a point where it's too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think I'm kind of starting to feel that like it, as many quilts as I want to make, there's some that I'm like, I'm just like, I gotta get, do something because I can't like bury myself in quilts. Cause yeah. Um, and I think it's just, you know, it just goes to show, you know, as I think about this rap Ukraine with quilts initiative and that her Gina and her team's goal is to just have a few hundred and now they're at like 8,000 and counting. It just goes to show you how many people have, have quilts that they would be more than happy right? to gift away and, and give to somebody that would find it, you know, a, a meaningful, a meaningful gift. So again, mm -hmm. just kind of going back to the spirit of, of givers in this community that it goes, yeah. it goes beyond fabric. I think um, there's always folks looking to, to pass along their quilts that are just taking up space that to that that as creators we just enjoyed making you know mm -hmm. in the process of making it um and then once we once we reach the end we don't really have a plan for where to always send it <laughs> right yeah exactly you're like okay what do I do with this now but <laughs> right <laughs> I don't know yeah that's awesome hopefully you know people will find comfort in that and and just knowing that you've made something so special that somebody gets to have and to give them comfort in such an uneasy time is really cool and yeah. I know like there was a I don't know if it's like an organization or somebody just kind of started it but last was it last summer when like California was just like on fire I mean I know it's not necessarily yeah. this year but like when they were so big and there was a lot of groups like making and donating quilts, like queen size quilts to make sure that families had stuff because their house is burnt down or whatever. And, and so I know the, the guild I'm in a lot of the, a lot of the people donated quilts and, and they had well over what they were expecting just, you know, because people were like, oh yeah, like I can part with this. I've, I've got a home, I've got shelter, I've got everything and I've got 50 quilts. I can give away some, you know, it's like becomes a point of like looking at our own, our own excess and our own kind of materialistic ideas and going, well, do I really need that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, and I think that's a great way to, to continue the generosity and, and to show show the love that goes into quilts and like help people understand like that it's we're not just doing it because it's fun and crafty like it is fun and crafty but it's also super meaningful it takes a lot of time and care and and especially if you're you're in a sustainable mode where you're looking for you know repurposed materials like you have to be so much more intentional than just going to the store and you're knowing everything is quilting cotton so you don't have to think about it too hard but I think the idea that there's way more thought behind it is kind of like extra special so agree yeah that's so cool so you're gonna have to make like a lot of baby quilts now <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully those are faster to make right yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm working on one and I'm trying to limit myself to one. <laughs> we'll oh. see how that, how that goes over time, but isn't that your warp and weft one? Yeah, it mm. is. Um, which has been a really hard and challenging project in a strange way. It, it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's a pattern called weftovers and it was created I think like eight years ago by um, I Candy Quilts, which is this mother daughter quilting duo. And they're, they're based out of Nebraska. And I have been eyeing this pattern since I started quilting because I love the look of it. And then I also loved that the makers were from my home state of Nebraska. That's where I grew up. And oh. so I was excited to hear, hear that little backstory, but the pattern really always intimidated me. So I put it off for years meaning the two years that I've been quilting <laughs> until, <laughs> until I finally decided to, to give it a go. And I thought, okay, I feel like I have a decent amount of 
of knowledge in my tool belt and skill level to, to attempt this. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it's still, it's been challenging. It's been challenging for a couple of reasons. I think one pattern writing has come a long way in the past eight years. And I think most of the patterns produced today mm -hmm. are really highly visual with a lot of charts and a lot of graphics and a ton of illustrations for a visual learner, which is me. I'm a super visual learner. Yeah, me too. I love all of that. This pattern in particular is far less visual and it relies a lot more on text instruction, which for me is really difficult personally. Yeah. And, and there are some rough illustrations, but it's mostly, it's mostly text. Um, and I, my brain just has a really hard time with that. Yeah. And so that's, that's one piece of it. And then the second piece of it is I'm mostly using woven fabrics, mm -hmm. which is a whole new ball game for me <laughs> yeah. and a whole different beast than traditional quilting cotton. And so I'm, I'm loving it. I love the idea of like these textures and, and how this is going to kind of all come together when all is said and done, but the, the piecing of wovens together and, and utilizing them have been, have been an interesting, like a fun challenge, but a challenge nonetheless, um, to just sort of learn how, how those interact together, which feels so different than, um, traditional quilting cotton, but, but thankfully the, you know, the Instagram community always comes to my rescue and yeah, <laughs> and sure. I put out a call for help, you know, of, of how to, um, read things in patterns or work with, you know, woven fabrics. And I get just always an outpouring of, of tips and tricks and advice from people. So, um, so I'm managing and it's yeah. coming together. <laughs> That's going to be better nicely. So yes, but this, that's the, yeah, the baby, the, the baby quilt that, um, that I'm working on. So fingers crossed, I can bring that over the finish line before early November. Okay. I'll cross my fingers for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's always like, it's always fun to think like, oh, I'm going to try this, you know, this quilt and it can't be that hard. And then I do the same thing. I like put it off. Cause I'm like, oh, it's like so different than what I normally do. And it's not just, you know, squares and rectangles or whatever. And, but the times that I've gone outside my comfort zone and tried something new and, you know, learned a new skill or something or 10, I don't know. It just depends on the, <laughs> the pattern, but I always feel so much more rewarded than just sticking to the same old, like I'll just stay in my comfort zone. Yeah. Yeah. But, and I mean, honestly, not all my points match up. I've lost a few in the process, but I'm not going to sweat it. It's, you know, <laughs> right. At the end, at the end of, the day, of the day, it, yeah. it's still going to look right. I'm loving how it's turning out. And, and I, I attribute those errors to the quilter, not the pattern maker <laughs> of, of this particular quilt. So I'm, I'm having fun doing it. Um, but I, I am glad that I didn't, it was like one of the very first patterns that I bought when I first started quilting and I am so glad it wasn't the very first one I attempted. Otherwise, I might not still be here two years later right. talking about quilting. <laughs> I'm like, I'll save that for a different day. Yeah. You knew you needed to save it, which is kind of good. Yeah. yeah. That would be sad to have been so, like, get discouraged so early in because I think you've made some really beautiful stuff. And I, your presence out there is is needed. I think that idea of yeah, using what you have and lowering your impact on the planet is really important. And so it's good. It's a voice that needs to be heard. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. So is it the hardest project you've ever done or have you done anything that's been worse? <laughs> I, I think it's probably the hardest one. I mean, I've intentionally picked like beginner friendly stuff in the past. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've made things um, with flying geese, which were really difficult for me at first, because when you've never made those before, they seem virtually impossible to trim and get right. And I'm still not totally sure. I, I've got it down. Um, yeah. I haven't attempted cool. another one with flying geese since. So maybe that's an indicator Ooh. of how I felt about it. But, um, so I would say probably, um, but only because, only because I err on trying, I've erred to date on trying to select like really beginner friendly stuff, just because I'm I'm very self-aware of my skill level. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. I mean, I think it's good to know where you're at, but yeah, I think it's hard. It's hard to like really make enough quilts to really practice the skill. It just takes time and 
and just keep going back to it over and over again. And eventually you're like, okay, I feel good about that. I'm ready to try something else, but yeah. oh man, I feel you on those geese. I, <laughs> oh, Struggle I is real. never made a flying, like, or made flying geese until this year. And really? I'm five and a half years into quilting and it was only because at the same time I was making a quilt for a client that had sawtooth stars, I was also making a pattern, testing a pattern for Katarina Rochella. And her pattern had a lot of flying geese in it to make the overall like motif that goes throughout the quilt. And so I was making a lot, like all in a row, <laughs> a ton of them. And I ended up making the same sawtooth star quilt for a different client out of different fabrics. And so I had to make even more. And I was like, what, why, why is this happening to me right now? And it wasn't until the, the last quilt I made with them that I finally was like, okay, I think I, these are okay. Like I didn't lose any of my points that time, which I was so stoked about because it's so easy to lose your point on the, you know, middle triangle. And if you don't trim it right. And I, Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Practice makes perfect, I guess. Well, <laughs> sort of perfect. I like to just say practice makes progress. There you go. <laughs> I like that. Um, I guess, so like, have you had, um, I guess, learning all your skills, is there something that you've accomplished kind of on your own that you were like, oh my gosh, I just realized why we do this or, oh, this is such an easier way to do this thing. Like, was there something you were struggling with that you had like an aha moment with that really just stuck with you? Um, I don't know that there's like one particular moment, but what I've found really interesting is that there's no... There's not always like a right or wrong way to do something. There's a lot of suggestions out there and, and notions that work for certain people. Um, but then, but then for others, you know, mm -hmm. they, they aren't as, um, useful to, to others, depending on your style or what kind of sewing machine you use or what, I mean, there's, it's just so, um, there's so much variety, like personal preference, and, and just like how your brain is wired and how you think about things that I found it really interesting when, um, when I reach out to people for tips on things and, and I honestly, I try, you know, whenever somebody gives me a tip about something, I try it all. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's interesting to me how many things I found that just didn't, didn't work for me. You know, it's like, I didn't really need that, that notion to get the job done, or I still prefer to do it this way, just because of the way that that my machine reacts when I, when I do this particular stitch or something. So I think it was more of just like an aha moment of, instead of trying to search for like the right answer mm -hmm. on how to do a specific technique all the time to source a variety of suggestions mm -hmm. and then try them out on your own and find what works for you. Yeah. Um, because you can get to the same end result in quilting and a lot of different quilting techniques in a variety of different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's, you know, that is a, an area where I, I like to source lots of different opinions because it's like, well, I learned this way, but it's not really working for me. And so just kind of reading through other people's explanations. And I think it's fun, like that so many quilters are making reels on just like little quick, you know, two to three minute videos on a, you know, a quick tip or like, oh, you can try it this way. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I never would have thought about that. And like, almost like I'm not looking for that, but then I see something and I'm like, oh, that's interesting and try it. And yeah, like you said, it doesn't always work, but for yeah. you, but just the idea that like, it's accessible to almost everybody. And if you get the job done in the way that you do it, then that's the right way. Like it doesn't yeah. have to be someone else's way. And there's a lot of different ways to do all the things <laughs> and there's a tool for everything, which is also crazy. Cause I think that can be cumbersome. Like yes. you have to pull out a notion or a tool for every little thing you do in quilting. Like it takes away the, the sustainability of being able to just do what you want with what you have. And so, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm all about the minimal number of, of notions and things that be, can be multi-purpose 
if it's a notion that just has a singular purpose for one thing, I, I probably don't own it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like, uh. And I recognize a lot of those tools really help achieve a level of perfection that my creations will never have. So right. I have, you know, and, and I'm cool with that. So if you're, you know, if mm -hmm. you're depends on what, you know, level of, um, of accuracy you want on things and, and yeah. where you're a little bit more flexible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think definitely for myself, I'm like fine with back to basics, you know, like pare it all down and do what's simple, but you know, when we're creating quilts for clients, I'm like definitely leaning sure. into those tools more. Cause I do want it to be as perfect as possible because someone's paying me to give them a, a high quality product. And so then I'll dive in, but yeah, it's, sure. it's all fun. It's fun to try new tools and see how things work. And there's so many fun functional rulers out there and, you know, multi-purpose ones that I'm kind of like, oh, I could use that. Cause then I could use it for this and I could use it for this. And, you know, but if you, if there's an explanation for how you could use some, everything multiple ways, you just end up with too much stuff. So <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. Um, well, is there, is there, um, another, or like a big, your next big thing in, in quilting that you want to accomplish, or mm. do you feel pretty satisfied in the moment, just practicing what you know, or, um, it's a good question. So let's see, what do I have coming, coming down the night? I'm hoping to finish my leftovers quilt, that one with all of the wovens, mm -hmm. um, before my baby gets here in November. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so that's a, that's a goal. Um, but I'm also working on, I haven't posted about it a lot recently because I've just been working on this other one so often, but, um, I'm working on a new scrappy quilt. Um, and I have a box of like, oh, nearly 2000, two inch square scraps that I've cut from my stash. Wow. And I'm going to make a, um, a quilt with traditional blazing arrow quilt blocks. That's my, my plan there. I'm not following any particular pattern, just was, looking for a quilt block that I found interesting that could use two inch. Um, I've got like two inch strips and two inch squares. Um, and I, I seemed to have a lot of those in my stash. So I sort of sourced the direction of that quilt based on what I had on hand. But I'm working on that. Um, I recently became really fascinated with people's obsession over Liberty of London fabrics. Oh, mm -hmm. and I like fell down this huge rabbit hole learning all about <laughs> yeah. learning all about like that fabric and just the history mm -hmm. of it and 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 quilters and and sewers obsession with it. Um so I I'm actually working on some new content on how to save money on Liberty fabrics and I have some fun hacks oh. um that I'm hoping to share in the future because I just found that so fascinating and I and I felt like there was something to maybe contribute there yeah. to that conversation. Um, and then, and then lastly, I'm, I'm in a really early stages of a fun collaboration with another, another quilter. Um, and I don't really have much more I can share about it at this point in time, but okay. stay tuned. There'll be, there'll be more to come on that, um, that I'll be sharing, of course, all across my Instagram channel. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, do you, do you quilt your own quilts? Like, do you, do you quilt them on your domestic? So I do, I've only ever sent two of my quilts to a long armor. Um, and the rest of them have been quilted on my domestic machine. And the last one I quilted on my domestic machine was the queen size. So I did a quilt as you go type mm -hmm. approach on that one, which I'd never done. So it was sort of a learning in process and sharing as I went. Um, but that was really, um, that was a really effective approach to like quilting on your own machine for a really, a really large quilt. But otherwise the largest ones I've ever done on my own machine where I've had to like push them through my machine is like twin size okay. quilts, um, which become pretty, pretty cumbersome. Um, but otherwise I've done, I've done all of them on my, my home machine, um, which is, which is fun, but also can be, it's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just machine binding is annoying to me. So I can't even imagine like yeah. the whole quilt through like to keep quilting. I'm like, oh, so I'm always impressed when people do it for themselves because I, <laughs> I have a long arm. So, you know, yeah. long arm my own quilts, but I think that, I don't know. I feel like there's been kind of more of a lean towards more traditional looking quilts lately. And there is tons of, obviously tons of modern designs out there 
still, you know, permeating the quilting space. But I think it seems like from what I can tell, like people are kind of leaning into that more traditional way of like more straight line quilting and more, you know, bringing in traditional blocks into a more modern design. And, and so I kind of am liking that simplified look, but also I really enjoy being able to like put crazy patterns into my quilt and like use crazy thread and like make it super obnoxious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I actually, I found, um, I'm really obsessed with this, um, this book called walk. It's a, it's all about mastering your, your machine quilting with a walking foot by oh. Jackie Gehring. I think it's her last name. And she shows you how to create like more than just straight line quilting, like how to do boomerangs, how to do like you, it still is under the guise of straight line quilting in, in a sense from point to point. It's, sure. um, it's not free motion. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've really found her, I think she has two books at walk and walk 2.0. I don't have the 2.0 one, but I have found that her book has allowed me to create more interesting, like just kind of think outside the box from, you know, it doesn't have to just be like a crosshatch sure. quilting pattern. Um, it certainly takes more time, um, and more planning, um, mm -hmm. but I've gotten some really cool results using, using her, her book and her recommendations on how to just use your own walking foot on your own machine and do some like point to point designs to create nested diamonds and boomerangs and all that good stuff, which has been kind mm -hmm. of fun. Yeah. That's so cool. I love that. I've only mm -hmm. ever quilted like tiny, tiny things, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, I mean, <laughs> now we're going to just do this right here. And yeah. Yeah. Oh man. That's really cool. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate our conversation and I am just, I'm a fan. So I'm really excited to be able to talk to you today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited about your initiative to use up what you have between now and the end of the year. I'm going to hold you to it. <laughs> okay. I won't buy any new fabric. And... But thank you for letting me, yeah, share my story and just encourage um, quilters out there to, you know, just do our part, think about the planet. Um, use what you have before you buy more and before you throw anything away, give it a second thought on how you might be able to repurpose it. Yeah, it's good. We need to spread the word and, you know, get it out there and share, share with each other. It's, it's a good, happy thing. So mm -hmm. I like that. Well, thanks again. And, um, remind our listeners where they can find you online. Yes. So I am on Instagram at next gen quilting and you can find me there. Um, everything, all my projects, um, all my tips, hacks, tricks, questions to the community. Um, they're all there. Awesome. Cool. Well, and I will link that in the video so people can find you easier. They don't have to like search around. So awesome. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. All right. Thanks. Amanda. Thanks.